First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul is complimenting, encouraging, talking about the church at Thessalonica, this brand new church. And he says, go back to verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, They themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and, and note this, to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Skip over to chapter 5. Verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. And that is my intention this morning. Father, I pray you would build us up. In our most holy faith, keeping us aware of not only the signs of the times in these times of the signs, Lord, but aware of and looking forward to the blessed hope of the coming of Jesus. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Keep us alert and aware and focused for all these things, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take this study in four parts. I'll give them to you right up front. We're going to look at hints of the harpazo. Hints of the harpazo. Harpazo is H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. If you don't know what that word is, you haven't been at the bridge very long. (laughs) And if you don't know still, I will tell you in just a moment. But hints of the harpazo. Secondly, divisions of doctrine. Thirdly, indications of indignation. And lastly, results of our rescue. So one more time, if you're a note taker, and I encourage you to be this morning, hints of the harpazo, divisions of doctrine, indications of indignation, and results of our rescue. Our rescue? Let's look at this one more time. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We will be caught up. Harpazo is the word in the Greek. Raptoro or raptus in the Latin. And in English, caught up. And in the Bible, there are so many hints of this. I want to give you a bunch of them this morning. Some of the hints are obvious, very clear, overt. Other hints are a little more obscure. Or they're embedded in teaching. Or they're covert in their presentation. But while Paul's teaching to the church at Thessalonica was brand new and exciting for them... His teaching was as old as history. This is not new. This was not new even as of the first century. It's not something that Paul came up with. It's not a new doctrine. It has been represented and taught and explained throughout history and on through the teachings of Paul, the early church. You can go back as far as Irenaeus at the beginning, about about 150, maybe 160 A.D. So just into the second century. And Irenaeus taught about the rapture of the church. Some people come along and they say, oh no, it was a thing invented by by, uh, Darby in the 1800s. Or Margaret MacDonald, some of those nuts of the brethren, the Plymouth brethren. They came up with this and it's just kind of a new teaching. No, it was a forgotten teaching. Because truly, if you look at the history of the church, the vast majority of that history from about 312 or so A.D. all the way up to the 1800s, there were not very many people who were teaching or talking about the rapture of the church. To hear about that, you got to go pre-312 A.D. or you got to go post-1800, which I find fascinating because prophecy in the church lost all steam until about the 1800s. 
which is interesting to me because it was just after that that then the interest in Israel began to arise and Jews began flooding back into the promised land and the nation of Israel was reestablished in 1948. And things have been breaking loose ever since. For the first two to three hundred years of the church, the early Christians believed in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. What exactly does that mean? We'll, We'll get there. But you can see throughout Scripture, even before Jesus came, hints of the harpazo. I want to look at a few of these this morning. Understanding how Paul closes out 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says in verse 24, Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. That's not just that God is faithful to his calling on your life. He is It's not just that God is faithful to something he's told you he's going to do. He's always faithful. But what Paul is talking about, what he will bring to pass, is all of these things, the run-up to the second coming of Jesus Christ, his coming, the coming kingdom, and everything after that. God is faithful. He will do it. He must do it. So understanding that, some hints of the harpazo, and we go all the way back to Genesis Chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Some of you will find a few of these hints familiar. I guarantee there are a few in here you haven't heard. But in Genesis chapter 5, we find the first hint of the harpazo, and it's an overt hint, it's an obvious hint, because we are introduced to the first man in all of history to be raptured. Most of you know his name, Enoch. Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam, that is, he's the seventh uh, grandson, if you will, of Adam himself. At a time when people lived a long, long time into the 900s, his son Methuselah would be the oldest man ever to live. Interesting, Enoch's son Methuselah, his name means in his coming or with, uh, in his death it will come. In his death it will come. Interesting to name somebody that, and Enoch named Methuselah that because as a prophet, Enoch, he was prophesying in the name of his son the coming of the flood. Methuselah died right before the flood hit planet Earth. Anyway, side note. But Enoch comes along, and this is a faithful man who loves God, who walks with the Lord. We're told in verse 21 of Genesis 5, he lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. And then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became father of Methuselah, so 365. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Rapture number one. So early on in history, we see the first man who did not die. He was just taken up. He was just raptured. The first hint that God might do this again was with Enoch. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 11 verse 5 said, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. He obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Taken up, taken up, taken up, harpazo. Enoch was raptured. And the Bible is clear about this as the first clue, the first hint of this concept, this amazing, this overwhelming idea that a person could just go and never die. The second clue uh, is interesting. It's, it's more of a, of a type. It's more of a picture, probably more covert. If you go on ahead to Genesis 19. Genesis chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible in your lap, feel free right now to sneak back there and grab a Bible off of the bookshelf in the back because you need one this morning. It's going to be all over the Bible. Genesis chapter 19, verse 15. Now, background. A man named Lot and his family are living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Many of you know the story, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Watch what happens to Lot. Verse 15, Genesis 19, when morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters. For the compassion of the Lord was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. 
Do not look behind you. And do not stay anywhere in the valley, or not stay in the the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. This was a moment of intense escape for what was about to come upon Sodom and Gomorrah, which was their utter destruction and decimation. No evidence of their existence now. Completely wiped off the planet. Escape, the angels said. What what is it about escaping that people consider cowardly? (laughs) Bye. What what (laughs) escape escape is not cowardice, my friends. Escape is oftentimes simply wisdom. Are you wise enough to walk away or to flee when you need to? I mentioned last week or the week before, my friend Greg Woodward owns Woodward's Taekwondo, and his motto is, man, it is wiser to run away than to stand and fight. You only fight if you absolutely have to, but it's foolishness. It's better to flee if you can flee, to step back if you can step back. And so the angels say very clearly to Lot and his family, escape, get out of here. Why are they hesitating? Because they loved where they lived. Yeah, but it was Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, don't you love where you live? I mean, don't we always all have kind of a sense of being settled in? And the angel said, no, you have got to escape. So the second hint here is of Lot escaping the destruction that would follow. Note that he escapes first and the destruction comes after. Keep that in mind. But Peter, referring to Lot, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, is talking about God's work with Lot and what he did. If he rescued righteous Lot, verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. If he rescued Lot, he can rescue you. He can get you out at the proper time. The word temptation there. If he knows how to rescue righteous Lot, he knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. The word temptation is parasmos. And that word depends on the context for its understanding. I I shared before, kind of like our word, we have lots of words like that, cold. It's cold outside, she was really cold to me. They mean two completely different things, and yet we use them and understand based on the context what's really being said. Same with parasmos. Parasmos can be translated temptation. He knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. But it's also translated affliction. God knows how to rescue the godly from affliction. From, we might say, tribulation. And Jesus declares that in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of parasmos. The Bible translates that from the hour of testing. It's also from the hour of affliction. But listen, Jesus says it's that which is about to come upon the whole world to test, to parasmos, those who dwell on the earth. I am going to keep you from affliction, an affliction that's about to hit the entire planet. By the way, for those who believe that everything described in the book of Revelation happened in A.D. 70, that's the preterist view. If you believe that, then you have to explain what Jesus was talking about when he said this was going to come upon the whole world, not just Israel. The A.D. 70 fall of the temple and the horror that Rome brought on the Jewish people at that time, yes, it was bad, but it was not global. And it is absolutely clear in the scriptures that this coming affliction, this tribulation, is global. More on that in a moment. Now, the third hint of the harpazo, of the catching up, you might want to turn in your Bibles on to 2 Kings. So keep going right until you get to Kings. 1 Kings, 2 Kings, chapter 2. The third hint involves the prophet Elijah. One of the greatest pictures of a rapture that we have in scriptures because it's not only exciting, it's fiery. Elijah and his protege Elisha are walking along, we're told, in chapter 2, verse 11. And as they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and Eric Little. No, no, he wasn't there. Um, A chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. Wow. Elisha. He saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. 
The rapture. Elijah is now the second person, at least we know of in Scripture, who did not die but went straight up. Enoch just walked home with God. Elijah caught a fiery chariot and taxied home in that. Amazing. Caught up. Didn't die. And Elisha saw it. He was witness to it. And it's implicit in the text that he began to talk about this. Hey, Elisha, where's Elijah? You're not even going to believe this, man. We were talking, and this chariot of fire and horses separated us. And next thing I knew, I saw him just taken up. He went up. What do you think people would have said who heard him say this? Crazy. You nut. What are you talking about? Caught up. It's actually the same thing people say these days when you talk about the rapture of the church. Well, that's crazy. That's just just that religious garbage, you know? It can't be true. Let me tell you something. I have had that same thought many times over my life. For a long time, as a Christian, I thought Christians who believed in the rapture were the nutty ones out there, you know? Until I started to read what the Bible said and to study it. And I can tell you this morning, I still think the doctrine is fantastic. It's still amazing. It's still supernatural. But you know what? So is God. He is capable of so much that we don't even have a clue about. And this idea of the rapture of the church, I absolutely buy it. Why? Because it's my tradition? No. But because the Bible teaches it. Explicitly in the language of Paul, we talked through that. We walked through 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 last week, didn't we? And we saw Paul describe this in detail, that we will be caught up to meet him in the clouds, in the air. We're going up. The first Corinthians fifteen fifty two says, In the twinkling of an eye, which is faster than a split second, we will simply be there. This is the promise of the Word of God. So you either take the Word of God at face value or you don't. I do. The idea of Elijah being caught up in a fiery chariot, how weird is that? Yeah, well, Elijah was weird. And so were the prophets. And so are the supernatural things of God, weird by our rational human understanding. And so sometimes we miss it simply because we're not willing to believe. There were those, I'm convinced, who missed it. People at the time that Elijah was caught up who actually made fun of him for it. And I think we see that in verse 23 of the same chapter, 2 Kings 2, 23. Then he, Elisha, went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, young lads came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. What are they saying? Ascend, baldo. They are, I believe here, making fun of the concept that Elijah had gone up. Elisha shared that, and they're going, oh, this guy's nuts. Oh, you go be raptured, too. You go up, bald guy, crazy, flat-footed, bald-headed prophet. You go up. I love what he does. When he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. That is a great verse for the follically challenged. <laughs> Especially if they happen to be a youth pastor. <laughs> Kids, be careful with what you say to Jake and his hair. All right? I've never been mauled by a bear, but I did make fun of a bald youth pastor, and look what happens! <laughs> Fast forward. So we have Enoch. We, we've got the picture in Lot. We have Elijah going up. And now, fast forward to the New Testament. Go all the way to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus came on the scene. And as he did so, something happened. And I don't know if you've ever really thought, stopped to think about this. But when Jesus arrived, there was a massive increase in demonic activity such as had not been seen in Israel I think that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jewish leaders and the people were looking around going what is up with this demon possession everywhere and as a matter of fact read the four gospels what is it that Jesus deals with most he's teaching he's healing and he's casting out demons When he sends out the 12, when he sends out the 72, he sends them out to preach the kingdom, to heal of diseases, and to cast out demons. 
Because there are demons everywhere. There are demons in people, men, women, pigs, demons all over the place. And it seems to be something that was happening happening concurrently with the ministry of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, it makes sense. Suddenly Satan realizes God is on the planet. So he starts to double down to increase his activity, to try and and throw Jesus' ministry off. Ultimately, to kill him was his hope, his desire, his goal. And it was accomplished, although not the way he thought it would be. It accomplished God's will. But in all of this demonic activity, Jesus, Matthew 12, 28, begins to explain this. They're calling him Satan. They're equating all this activity with Jesus. And he says to them in verse 25, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? He's saying, look, it's really foolish to call me Satan when I'm the one casting Satan and his demons out. Why would I do that? If I was Beelzebul, I would be wanting more people possessed than possible. Well, verse 27, he says, if I by Beelzebul cast out demons... (laughs) By whom do your sons cast them out? And then he says, for this reason, they will be your judges. But, and this is the point, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If this is a work of God, watch out. Because the kingdom is here. How was the kingdom there? The king was there. And the king is casting out demons right and left, and then he explains why. Watch this, verse 29. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? The strong man is Satan. Satan, the god of this world, the usurper of this house. And everything Satan has is stolen goods. So what happens? Jesus says... I'm coming to plunder the house. But before the plundering of the house can take place, the strong man must be bound. Before the rapture, the strong man is bound. And that's exactly what happened in the surprising sacrificial death of Jesus. Satan was bound. His hands are tied behind his back. Do you understand that? If you believe in Jesus Christ, his hands are tied. He cannot... He cannot possess you anymore. He cannot direct you. He can lie to you, and he does. He can try to scare you, and he does. But his hands are tied. The strong man has been bound in the name of Jesus. And you don't need to live under that deception anymore. That's what happened. But I love this. Jesus says, and he will carry off his property. The word carry off, harpazo. Harpazo. Rapture. You bind the strong man so that then you can come in and carry off, seize, catch up his property. And that's what Jesus is going to do. For all who simply believe in the name of Jesus, the strong man is bound and you now become the plunder of Jesus Christ. He will plunder this house. He's going to do it soon. Carrying off, harpazo, rapturing the plunder itself. By the way, this word harpazo, I've mentioned, I mentioned it on Wednesday night. This is a powerful word. It literally means to forcefully seize. There is inherent power in the concept of the rapture of the church. And it is a power that Jesus alone has. When I was a kid, I remember a man at church who used to come up to me. Great guy, really nice guy, but he... I hated his handshakes because he took pleasure in crushing my little bones. You met guys like that? How you doing? You know, and you hear this crack, snap, you know, and you walk and your hands all twisted up. He did this every Sunday. He had quite a grip. Listen, nobody has the grip that Jesus has. Who said in John 10, 28, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hands. That word is harpazo. No one can catch you up, can seize you away, can snatch you out of the hand of Jesus Christ. When he has you, he has you. Believers, Jesus would know, would want you to know this morning, your salvation is secure with him. He's got you, not because of you. 
Oh, your salvation is not secure because of you. If you think that your salvation has to do with you and your work and how well you're doing today, you're in trouble. But it depends on him. And he says, nobody can rapture you out of my hand. He's the one who raptures. He even doubles down himself. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to harpazo them out of the father's hand. He's the one who seizes. He's the one who carries off. He's the one who plunders the house. Now, go to the New Testament further on, Acts chapter 8, the next example. So again, some some hints, some covert examples, some interesting teachings of, of Jesus, and there are others. But now we have another tangible example of, of a rapture, of a harpazo taking place, Acts chapter 8, down in verse 39. You know this story, you know Philip the evangelist, the deacon. Not Philip the apostle, Philip the evangelist has been in Samaria. And part of a huge, huge uh, outpouring of the Spirit there, Samaritans, half Jews, are now being baptized and receiving the Lord, and, and wonderful things are happening there. And so the Lord taps Philip, who's the first one down there, and he's working through Philip. Some of the apostles come down, and then the Lord taps Philip and says, Hey, I need you. I need you to go south. What? Wait. This is where the fun is. Lord, this is where the the evangelism explosion is taking place. This is the harvest crusade of harvest crusades right here in Samaria. And you want me to do what? I need you to go south because there's one person I need you to meet. Listen, he will do that. Don't think your life insignificant because you're not standing up preaching in front of the thousands, but you are led to the one. I have always thought if, if we as followers of Jesus could lead one person to the Lord, that is an eternal gift. That's amazing. So he heads south down to the Gaza Road. You may know the story. On the Gaza Road, he runs into this Ethiopian in a chariot who's reading the book of Isaiah. He's at Isaiah 53, and he says, I don't get this. Philip comes walking up. And the Ethiopian looks at him and, I don't know why, says, Could you explain this to me? Philip gets into the chariot. They begin to talk. Next thing you know, the Ethiopian's heart is pierced. He's convicted that this Isaiah 53 passage is about Jesus, was fulfilled in Jesus. He believes in Jesus. They come upon water and he says, Hey, can I get baptized? Yeah, down into the water they go. And then in verse 39 of Acts chapter 8. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. Harpazo. He raptured him. (laughs) And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. And I think a little freaked out. (laughs) But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through and kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Listen, this, this rapture picture we get, it's a short distance rapture. It's not the sweet by and by, it's the sweet nearby. You know, he just gets caught out, seized, taken away. He's with the Ethiopian one minute in Gaza, next minute he's up in Ashdod. That's what Azotus is. 20 miles. He's transported instantaneously. And then he goes on preaching the word. So there's another picture of a rapture taking place, an unexpected instantaneous event. Hint number five, Paul himself. The apostle Paul himself turned to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Paul, who wrote about the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul now describes his own experience of a rapture. Listen to this. He says in verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Do Bible students know that Jews have three heavens? The atmosphere, outer space, third heaven is where God resides. So he says, I know a man who was caught up. And then he says, going on in uh, verse 4, he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. Paul is talking about Paul. In fact, he even says further down in verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given a thorn in the flesh. Paul had a moment, had a time. We don't know exactly when it was. We, we can guess and look at some things where he was raptured. 
I think it's possible it's when he was stoned to death. The Bible tells us that he came out of, uh, forget which city it was. Doesn't matter. He came out of the city. They stoned him to death. They left him for dead. All the believers thought he was dead. If you remember the passage, and then he stands up and he goes back into the city to preach some more. When that happened, I think it's possible that was a moment where he really was dead, where his spirit was immediately raptured, immediately went up. And he experienced this. But you need to note there in 2 Corinthians 12, where he talks about this, this description where he says, this man was caught up, he uses the phrase twice, caught up to the third heaven, caught up into paradise, harpazo, raptured, seized, pulled out, caught up. So Paul knew something Of which he taught. The Apostle John. Turn over to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4. John understood something. Of being raptured. Caught up. It says in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. After these things I looked. And behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard. Like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me. Said come up here. And I will show you what must take place. After these things. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold a throne was standing in heaven. And one sitting on the throne. John was raptured. What's interesting here. In the book of Revelation. If you study this you know. Jesus told John. I want you to write something down. I want you to write this out. It says in Revelation 1.19, I want you to write down the things that you've seen, John. What had he seen? Revelation chapter 1, he had seen Jesus glorified. Write about that, Jesus says. He says, I want you to write about the things which are. Well, what would that be? Well, it was the church age, which John was already a part of. And it's continued right up to this day. Write about the things which are. And then he says, and I want you to write about the things which will take place after these things. After these things is how chapter 4 begins. Write about what you've seen, chapter 1. Write about the things which are, chapters 2 and 3, which are letters to seven churches that cover the entire church age. We will study that soon, hopefully. I think in about a year if the Lord waits that long. Two and three, all about the church. Suddenly you get to chapter four and you're in heaven. Chapters four and five, heavenly vision. John's there, caught up, raptured, voice of a trumpet. Sounds a lot like First Thessalonians 4. And in 4 and 5, it's all a heavenly experience where we see, I believe we see the church in heaven. And then in chapter 6, all the way through chapter 19... You have the tribulation and the church is not there. Not mentioned a single time in the rest of Revelation until you get to the bride of chapter 19. Interesting. But we see John raptured as somewhat of a portrayal. Then finally, turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Finally, John writes, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Let's get down to verse five. And she gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who is that? That's Jesus. Obviously, he's the one who will rule the nations. And her child was caught up, Harpazo, to God and to his throne. Jesus was caught up in the ascension of Jesus Christ. We see a rapture. Now, it's a slower rapture than ours will be because the apostles watched him as he ascended. And we will not be watched when we ascend. It will be so instantaneous. We will just be gone. We will just be instantaneously with Jesus. So Jesus himself was caught up. These are hints of the harpazo throughout Scripture. By the way, Revelation 12, 1 and 2 is very interesting to me. And I've been reading this and thinking about it, looking into some things perhaps you've heard as well. We're going to talk about this more explicitly on September 17th. Sunday morning, September 17th, we're going to do our next prophecy update. And it will be on Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to look into this. Why? Because the description, what we read in verses 1 and 2, of the sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars, we will actually, on September 22nd and 23rd of this year, see that in the heavens. 
That uh, design of the stars involving Virgo, the woman, involving the star Regulus, meaning regal or the king star, actually being birthed out of Virgo and coming out and going above Virgo, the moon at her feet, the sun above, 12 stars above her head, and then above that, Leo. And that happens on September 22nd and 23rd. Interestingly, right after September 20th and 21st, which is Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. (laughs) That's it for me. See you at the picnic. What does that mean? You know what? Don't freak out. Don't worry. Don't start buying up horoscopes. That would just be dumb. Because the horoscopes, you know, God did not give us the stars so that we could know our future, that this week you're going to meet a stranger. Don't you meet a stranger every week? I mean, you know, isn't that interesting? The horoscopes are always broad enough that it could apply to anyone. A blue-eyed person will hand you something. Whoa, it happened. (laughs) No, the stars are there, however, to be signs for us. Jesus said as much. There will be signs in the heavens, he says. So we as Christians would be wise to be alert to these things, not to be freaked out. But we will be aware of these, and, and Lord willing, talk about that on September 17th. Now, hints of the Harpazo are all over the scripture. I haven't even gone through the passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, because we've talked so much about those. But now it's divisions of doctrine. Divisions of doctrine. Let me, let me just lay this out for you. The next thing on the prophetic calendar, the next thing, nothing has to happen before this, is the rapture of the church. Following the rapture of the church comes the tribulation. I'll explain in a moment. Following the tribulation then, rapture, tribulation, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. He will establish then the millennial kingdom which will run for a thousand years, Revelation 20 tells us six times. A thousand years it will run, and after that will be final judgment, and at that point God does a whole new thing. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, and that is the timeline. And some say, well, I think it's this way or that way. Or if we can spin it around and flip it upside down, it gets really to what I think. Listen, it's plain. It's simple. There is a biblical chronology to these things if we just take the Bible at face value. You don't have to jump through a lot of hermeneutical hoops. Why do people do that? Because we have a tradition that we're comfortable with and we cling to. I have had that. Much of my life did not believe or buy that exact chronology that I just shared with you. Because it wasn't my tradition. Well, you know what? Tradition be hanged. We live by the word of God. We do what God says. And if you will study the Bible, you're going to have your traditions blown apart right and left. Because truth does that. Why are there so many different views if it is so plain and simple? Well, to answer that, we need to go to a classical source of wisdom. Not Charles Spurgeon, but Charles Brown. In his classic 1966 animated special, it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, Linus is sitting at the table, and he's writing a letter to the great pumpkin. We watch this every year. Cracks me up. Charlie Brown comes up to Linus and says, when are you going to stop believing in something that isn't true? And Linus retorts, when you stop believing in that fellow with the red suit and the white beard who goes, ho, ho, ho. Charlie Brown says, turns to the camera, we obviously are separated by denominational differences. (laughs) Classic. And he's right. And you know what? I have no problem confessing this to the world. There are denominational differences in the church. We are not superhuman. We're people. And we do see things differently, and we're, we're trying to figure out the truth, but like all people, we settle into th- certain things, and we get comfortable with our traditions, and we all know sometimes our very doctrinal views can divide us. You know what? Sometimes they must divide us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. There must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. There are factions. There are divisions. you got to expect that. You just want to be among those 
approved <laughs> when that happens. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. What does a sword do? It cuts. It divides. It's piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. What I'm getting at is that it's God's word that divides fact from fiction, clarity from confusion, truth from myth. So we go to the word of God. Jesus said, John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We need to be a people of the word. Yeah, Rick, we hear that from you all the time. I know I'm going to keep saying it. We need to be in the Word daily, constantly, not just every Sunday. Not just on Wednesday nights or Thursday night if you choose that offering, September 7th. Not just these different times, not just in my my occasional small group, my occasional meeting with other believers. Man, this should be our lives in the Word of God, pouring over the Scriptures, seeking to understand and know because this tells us where we're going and how it's going to happen. God is clear on these things. Didn't Paul say, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren. Don't be ignorant. Be informed. Don't be a label maker, baby, but be informed. A label maker? You know, I'm not a pre-tribber. Oh, Rick, wait a minute. I've heard you teach about the pre-tribulation rapture. Oh, I I have, and I do believe that, but I'm not a pre-tribber. I'm also not a (laughs) post-toasty. I'm not a preemie. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Period. I have certain doctrines that I cling to because I read them and study them and see them in the Word of God. Well, can't you be wrong sometimes, Rick? Yes, I absolutely can. Show me where. Show me in the Word. Because I know I can miss it. We all can. But the more we're in the Word, the more assured of the truth we are by the Word. Seek to know and live by the Word of truth. So understanding that, I want to define quickly some different views regarding the rapture of the church being caught up and the glorious appearing of Jesus, that is, when he comes down. Do you know, do you understand, those are two separate aspects of his second coming? We were in Toppins on Friday having some ice cream, the kids, and, and Deb Seibel was there with the grandkids, and, and Cheryl and I, and we're, and we're just kind of talking a little bit about this because Deb's unable to be here this morning, and, and so we're talking about what we're going to share today. And this young man, the table over, stood up, walked over, stood at our table, and looked at me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he says, you believe that the rapture and the second coming of Jesus are two events? And I went, yes, I do. He said, no, they're not. They happen all together. It's just one thing. It's just one second coming. And I said, well, let me explain. And I started preaching this morning's teaching. (laughs) Started getting in. He had no idea who he was talking to. (laughs) No idea what I had been preparing all month long here. I'm like, man, you just stepped into it deep. And we started talking about it. And I just started laying out scripture and talking about, you know, the difference between the blessed hope and the the glorious appearing of our great God and Father, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Two separate things. It's obvious in the scriptures. Whoa, whoa. And we we talked it through, but not as much as this. Listen, I'm going to give you a list quickly. And I want to make this available. So staff, hold me to this. Let's make sure I do this. I have this list up in my office. I will print it up. We'll put put it out for you next week, okay? But distinguishable differences biblically with scriptures provided and everything between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus. And when you see these together, you realize it can't be the same event. Listen, the rapture of the church, when that happens, only those who are caught up will see him, according to 1 Thessalonians 4. In the glorious appearing of Jesus, every eye will see him. In the rapture of the church. That can happen at any time. Nothing precedes it. We do not know the exact day or the hour. It can happen at any time. The glorious appearing of Jesus happens exactly seven years after Israel signs a covenant with Antichrist. We know exactly the time of the second coming. Seven years after that point. In the rapture of the church, Satan is caught off guard, but he runs rampant in the world. He starts to go crazy, pouring out wickedness everywhere. 
in the glorious appearing, Satan is bound and imprisoned for a thousand years. Question for those of you who are preterists and believe everything in Revelation happened back in A.D. 70. Is Satan bound? Now, I mean, does any, can anyone honestly say in today's world that Satan is bound and imprisoned? Well, Rick, you said his hands were tied. Yes, from anyone who believes in Jesus. But he's still actively at work. Peter says he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is hard at work in this world. He is not bound. But when Jesus returns at the glorious appearing, he will be bound and imprisoned for a thousand years. At the rapture of the church, we go to a place prepared in heaven. At the glorious appearing, Jesus establishes his throne on earth. In the rapture of the church, our stay is short term. Seven years, earth time. With the glorious appearing, the earthly stay is for a thousand years. Where do you get that thousand years? I said six times in Revelation 20, it is spelled out a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. So that we might understand and know that clearly. In the rapture of the church, believers are judged. At the judgment seat of Christ, we go up and we are judged for rewards, not for salvation, because your salvation is in Jesus. But believers are judged for rewards at the second coming of Jesus. Nations are judged, to get that, not individuals. Nations are judged for entry into the kingdom, Matthew 25 tells us. Again, I'll put this all out for you. In the rapture, we're caught up to meet Jesus in the air. At the glorious appearing of Jesus, he sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Two different events. In the rapture of the church, Jesus comes for his own to meet us in the air. At the glorious appearing, he comes with his own back to establish his kingdom in which we will rule and reign with Jesus. Revelation 1, 5, and 20 all talk about it. Why aren't these two events simultaneously? Or simultaneous? What happens that separates them out? Number three in our, in our listing here. Indications of the indignation. Years ago, I ran across an interesting hint of the Harpazo. I didn't mention this earlier, but it's a curiously covert invitation of the Lord. Listen to it now. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. Isaiah prophesies that. There was a a present fulfillment to a degree, a a warning of Isaiah the prophet to the people of Jerusalem. Man, hide in your rooms because because some things are coming down. God is indignant with Assyria. He's going to wipe them out. He's going to take them down. So hide out. And, and, And that can be applied. But the picture is interesting because of the word indignation. In the Hebrew scriptures, indignation refers to the final global earth-shattering wrath of God. When that word is used, that's the connection. The Jewish mind would understand that. In Hebrew, it's za'am. And indignation means just that. The indignation, the fiery wrath of God. Here are some verses to confirm this. Jeremiah 10, verse 10. The Lord is the true God. He's the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath, the earthquakes. The nations cannot endure His indignation. Daniel chapter 8, verse 19. Gabriel, the angel said, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 6. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. Zephaniah the prophet, chapter 3, verse 8. The Lord says, wait for me for the day when I rise up as a witness. My decision, God says, is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, and to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger. Listen, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Not just Israel. Not just Babylon. Not just this nation or that. But the entire earth, a global indignation of God, is prescribed and declared in the scriptures. It will, it must happen. Wednesday night, we looked at the day of the Lord. 
the day of the Lord that begins with this very indignation. If you haven't heard Wednesday night's teaching, please go back and listen to it. I, I, I've told you I'm trying to present this. I can't do it all at once. So we're presenting this in, in a couple of Sundays, maybe three Sundays, and two or three Wednesdays, looking at all of this in this, this eschatological, this end times picture. Because I don't want anybody to be uninformed or to miss it. But looking at that, the event that comes between the rapture of the church and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ is the indignation of God. It is the tribulation. That is the chronology of these things. In the New Testament, the indignation is the tribulation. Seven years of God pouring out His wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. The only reason he wants to pour out wrath, must pour out wrath, is because he is a just God and will repay all manner of wickedness. He's going to do it. Don't you want him to be just? I do. I want right to be made right again. And for all that that's wrong to be cast away and dealt with, he will deal with it. He must deal with it because he is a righteous God. Seven years. Some people say, seven years. How do you know it's seven years? Where do you get that? Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, which in and of itself is like a three-week study. But in that, Daniel is given the exact timeline, and that timeline includes, and listen just quickly, 77s. That is 70 Shabuah is the word in the Hebrew. 70 periods of seven, 70 what we might call weeks of seven. 77 year periods is what's described there. 490 years. How do you know that? (laughs) Because he sets it off with a certain point in history. From the decree, which declares the the reestablishment, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, to this point there will be, he says, 69 sevens. To what point? From the establishing of of Jerusalem, or the rebuilding of Jerusalem, Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. Given the decree by Artaxerxes of Persia to go back. He goes back, he rebuilds Jerusalem in time of distress, which is what the Bible declares. That starts the, the 77s going. 69 sevens is 483 years. We should expect something to happen 483 years after Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem. We know when that date was... And we know that 483 years later, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He came in as king. He was crucified that week as criminal. And in that moment, the clock stopped. 69 out of 70 seven-year periods stops right there with the crucifixion of Jesus. Well, how do you know that? Because everything leading up to that, and it's described very explicitly, you go there and read it, everything described has happened historically. I don't have time to go into it this morning, but you can look at it and see 483 years that were prophesied happened exactly as described. And then the, the, the Messiah was cut off after those 483 years. Jesus was crucified. But then the next seven years from the crucifixion of Jesus forward, nothing happened. Nothing that fits what is described. The clock stopped. We have one seven left. One period of seven years that has not happened. It will happen. It is the indignation. You see, after Jesus was crucified and rose again, the church really got underway. The church age began to roll out. And across those first seven years, the church was just being birthed and growing and continued to grow. We've had 2,000 years of the church, the church age, this, you might say, dispensation. But at the end of this, the church is called out and God turns and begins to deal again with Israel. And the clock will begin to tick. And we'll roll out seven years of tribulation. Daniel 9.27 says, And he, that is Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many, that is Israel, for one week, one period of seven years. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. I'll explain that next week. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So there is a point coming, and it will be after the rapture of the church. I think in short order, very quickly, where Israel will sign a covenant with a man of peace, Antichrist. 
from the moment that that covenant is signed, the clock starts, and seven years will tick by before Jesus comes back to rule and reign. Where do you get this, Rick? The entire book of Revelation, Daniel chapter 9, and other parts of Scripture are very clear if we will read and study it. Now note that the rapture of the church does not technically begin the tribulation. The covenant does that, the signing of that covenant. What the rapture does is create the atmosphere for the tribulation. For with the rapture of the church, the church goes out. The spirit goes with the church. All the restraint of wickedness that currently resides in the world right now will be taken up and gone. And Satan will go on like a flood. And the tribulation will begin. John goes beyond this. He describes the last half of seven years. What is half of seven years? Three and a half years, right? So we should expect something like that in Revelation to describe the latter part of the tribulation, shouldn't we? Three and a half years? John wants to make sure we don't miss it, so he says it three ways. Revelation 11, verse 2, and 13, verse 5. He says it will be 42 months. Three and a half years. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. He says it will be 1,260 days, three and a half years. And then for anybody who missed it, Revelation 12, 14, he says it will be a time, times, and half a time. I can't do a half finger. (laughs) But you know what I'm trying to do here? Three and a half years. It's absolutely specific. And then Matthew 24, 21, Jesus, after describing the onset of Antichrist and and what's happening globally, says, and then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And that's the last three and a half years, sometimes called the great tribulation. There's so much here. When we leave the simplicity of the scriptures... When we try to hang our hopes on on human tradition or dogma, when we try to bend the Bible to fit what we're comfortable with, we confuse the whole thing. We end up with things like what's called the post-tribulation rapture. The post-tribulation rapture. That's those who say we will go through the rapture or through the tribulation and we'll be raptured at the end of it. We will suffer through the seven years. We will experience, go through the wrath of God poured out on this world. But at the end of it, if we survive, if we still have our heads, then we'll be raptured, post-tribulation rapture. That perspective gained ground back 300 A.D. or so in the mid-300s when people came along and started to say, things are getting better for the church. Life is good. The church and Rome climbed into bed together. And suddenly the persecution was over. And they thought, hey, post-tribulation rapture. We're just going to get better and better. The church will rule the world. And then when Jesus comes, we'll hand him the, the kingdom on a silver platter and say, haven't we done well? Post-tribulation, then we're caught up. Then we're raptured. Which is kind of dumb because what is it? It's, it's up and down. That's what I've called bungee theology. I'm going to go up and come right back down. It's post-toasty. We're going to go through this time of tribulation and indignation and wrath of God, and it is unbiblical. Then there's the pre-wrath rapture, which was an idea that was taught first in the 1970s. It was popularized in the 1990s, which teaches for the most part the church will be caught up before any serious wrath. The problem with the pre-wrath rapture view is that it teaches that, that a, a split rapture, some saints will be caught up and some will be left here to fight it out, you know, to be a tribulation force and really to take on Satan. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Again, it's unbiblical. Wednesday night, I brought up the subject of the mid-tribulation rapture, which is a, a lot of people kind of like that because it's not, it's not the full-on crazy rapture that you're just out of here before anything happens. You go through a little bit. You get to the point of the, of the mid-tribulation. It seeks to meet Jesus halfway. I don't like compromises of the truth. I feel personal opinion that the mid-tribulation rapture is somewhat of a compromise. Understand that the mid-trib rapture confuses the last trumpet of God with the seventh trumpet that's blown by an angel in Revelation chapter 11. I think we talked about that a little bit last week, didn't we? 
It makes that confusion. The mid-tribulation rapture assumes that the first half of the tribulation is no wrath at all. The wrath doesn't start until the last three and a half years. And the first, you know, three and a half, not a big deal. Listen, to save time, I'm going to rip you through this very quickly. The first half of the tribulation is completely described in Revelation chapter 6. The last half of the tribulation picks up in Revelation chapter 7 and runs all the way through 19. So the bulk of the teaching on the tribulation and the wrath of God is talked about from 7 forward. But you need to read Revelation chapter 6 and ask yourself, is this a time of wrath or not? And it is described in Revelation 6.17 as the wrath of the Lamb. It is the wrath of Jesus unleashed. Jesus is the one who unleashes every single one of these, what they're called, seal judgments. John sees a seal, with a scroll with seven seals, and Jesus begins to pop these seals. The first seal he pops, let's loose Antichrist. The second seal, war, and then famine, death, martyrdom, terror. You read all that, you got to ask the question, does that sound like a good time? Does that not sound like wrath? And it is at the hands of the Lamb who is unleashing the wrath of the Lamb. And I do not understand the fascination of wanting to stick around. Now oh, I'm going to be here in the, ra- in the tribulation. And you're stupid. And I've said before, what soldier wants to go into battle? They're the dangerous ones. Right? Navy personnel back me up on this. Aren't the dangerous ones the ones who can't wait to, you know, mix it up and shoot a few people? You don't want a commander like that. You want a commander who cares for his men and women, a commander who will stand for them, who will protect them, who does not want to see them go through that. Sometimes when wars are necessary, we must. It's the right attitude of a soldier to go into war not wanting to kill, not wanting to mix it up and mess it up. The pre-tribulation rapture, the biblical view. Oh, Rick, I can't believe you said that. Well, I didn't. The Word of God teaches a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, that the church is caught up and taken out. I'll give you one other example I may have given you recently, but our sister uh, Diane made this comment to me a couple or three weeks back. She said, does it make any sense that a groom would see his bride dressed in white, pure and clean, and then throw her into the garbage? Would Jesus work to purify the church, his bride, only then to thrust her into wrath and pain and tribulation? Does the groom show up before the wedding and beat up the bride? No. That is not the heart of God. The promise is that we will be taken out in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, again, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them, those who have died in Christ in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And then he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. So let me ask you. What is comforting about the advent of Antichrist, war, famine, death, martyrdom, and terror? Does that comfort you? We serve a God who by nature, His Spirit is called what? The Comforter. That's the God we serve. Not a God who says, I want you to believe in me, and then I'm going to kick the snot out of you, and then we'll see if we can work it out after that. (laughs) Comfort each other. It is not comforting to think, I'm going into tribulation. If I was sharing that with you this morning, you would go out and you're really bummed. Guess what? It's going to get bad, and then it's going to get worse, and some of you are going to have your heads chopped off, and others are going to be sucked into the ground in an earthquake. Meteors are going to blow up a few of you. It's going to be terrible. And then Jesus will come. Wow, thanks for that, Pastor. That's great. Go back now to 1 Thessalonians 5, and let's begin our study for today. (laughs) For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake, that is alive right now, 
or a sleep that is having died prior to that time, we will live together with Him. Does that comfort you? It does me. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. My friends, for those who say rapture theology is Christian escapism, I say no, duh. Of course it is. That's the whole point. Jesus said, Luke 21, 36, keep on the alert at all times. How, Lord? Praying that you may have strength to escape. All these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Strength to escape. You know where the strength to escape comes from? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll share this with you really quickly. I just was told this. I'm going to have to tell first service people this next week. I love this. In fire safety, we had a sister who just came back from a fire safety training. And she said there are three things when you are fighting a fire. And Chris, perhaps you know this. Three things you need to keep in mind. Number one, you need an anchor point. You need a place where you dig in. Secondly, you need an escape route. And you need to keep your eye on that escape route as the fire approaches and things come near. You're anchored in, but you have an escape route. And then thirdly, thirdly, you need a place to go. That's exactly what we have. Our anchor point is the strength of Jesus Christ himself. We are anchored into Jesus. And with that anchor, we have the blessed hope. We have the escape route. We know where it is. Jesus said, you know the way I am going. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is our escape. We're anchored into Christ. We have an escape that is promised the rapture of the church. And we have a place to which we're going. To be with Jesus forever. Have you prayed the very prayer that Jesus commands us to pray? Pray that you may have the strength to escape In the rapture of the church. Have you prayed that? Do you pray that? Understand that it is the expectancy of going home with him that sits at the heart of our perseverance. That I know at any moment he will call me home and he is going to rescue me from wrath. He will save me from tribulation. He will keep me from the time of the parasmos, the testing, the affliction that's going to come upon the whole world. He promises to do that. Man, I trust that. I walk in that and I am looking for His coming. The strength to escape is through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then He says, therefore, encourage one another, build up one another, just as also you are doing. And that's, that's what we're left with. That's what I'll conclude with right now. Understand, belief in the rapture of the church, specifically the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, it builds us up. It is intended to build us up. It comforts us, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. It purifies us. 1 John 3.3, John says, Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. I mean, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you know that you may be called out at any moment, aren't you thinking about what you're doing in that moment? Don't you day by day consider? Gentlemen, I hate to pick on you. I'll say gentlemen and ladies, anyone who has a trouble has trouble looking at things on the Internet that they shouldn't be looking at. Remember, the rapture is at any moment. Do you want Jesus to call you out from that? Do you want him to call you out of drunkenness? Do you want him to call you out of some immoral position or situation or or anything that we might do that's not honoring to him? But man, if I know his coming is imminent, could happen at any time, man, I'm just going to live pure. I'm living for that moment. And I'm having the wherewithal and the thoughtfulness to recognize there are things that my flesh wants to do. But whoa, wait a minute. Do I want to be doing those things when he calls me home? It's not about guilt and shame. It's about purity. It's about sanctification. And pre-tribulation understanding that biblical view purifies us just as he is pure. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 again, it says it builds us up. So keep building each other up in these things. It's why we're taking the time to talk about all of this. But finally, get this. Not only does it do all these things and much more, but living with belief and faith in the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture, just might end up rapturing someone other than you. 
What do you mean? Jude verse 20. I'll just read it to you. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life, and have mercy on some who are doubting, and save others, snatching them out of the fire, the word harpazo. Your rapture is not the only thing at issue here. It is the rapture of somebody else. And if I am living to that imminent return of Jesus, it may very well be my example, my faith, my trust in the Lord Jesus that causes this person or that person to be caught up as well. Father, keep us in the tension between the imminent return of Jesus and the people we know and love who right now don't know Him. Lord, I pray that You don't let us out of it. Don't relieve us by ignorance. Don't don't let us, Father, slip back into lethargy and not thinking about it just because it's hard to think about. But we know that today, in this moment, if I didn't finish this prayer before You raptured us out of here, there would be so many lost. So many who would then go into the tribulation. And my heart's desire, my prayer this morning, Father, is that You will keep us in that tension. Help us excitedly, expectantly look for Jesus coming and not forget we are surrounded by people who need Him as desperately as we do. Lord, keep us there until You come. And we pray Your grace would be poured out in the name of Jesus. Amen.